Rothbard wrote in 1992 that there was nothing to be concerned about with David Duke running for office. It is fascinating that there was nothing in Duke's current program or campaign that could not also be embraced by paleoconservatives or paleolibertarians. Lower taxes, dismantling the bureaucracy, slashing the welfare system, attacking affirmative action and racial set-asides, calling for equal rights for all Americans, including whites. What's wrong with any of that? Rothbard introduced in the same article the right-wing populist program, where he calls for ignoring white-collar crime or crimes committed by rich white plutocrats, and calls for the unleashing of police in the inner city to clear the streets of what he calls bums and vagrants. I don't think I need to point out the obvious code language taking place there. Rothbard was a key figure in formulating the paleo-libertarian strategy, which was a strategy to recruit neo-Nazis and white supremacists into the right libertarian movement. Rothbard's right-wing program also calls for an America First strategy, which is the same terminology used by David Duke in that election, and was later picked up by Donald Trump as a dog whistle to neo-Nazis. I was the first major candidate in modern times to promote the term and policy of America First. And you're right, my policy is America First. It's time that we take an America First policy in the world. America First! Rothbard also makes an appeal to Christo-fascists. Public schools must allow prayer, and we must abandon the absurd leftist atheist interpretation of the First Amendment that establishment of religion means not allowing prayer in public schools. Rothbard finishes his right-wing populist program writing. So far, every one of these right-wing populist programs is totally consistent with a hardcore libertarian position. In his 1927 book, Liberalism, Mises wrote positively about Italian fascism and the use of state force to crush workers' movements. It cannot be denied that fascism and similar movements aiming at the establishment of dictatorships are full of the best intentions and that their intervention has, for the moment, saved European civilization. The merit that fascism has thereby won for itself will live on eternally in history. Mises also served as an economic advisor to the Austro-fascist dictator Engelbert Dollfuss, as Dollfuss was destroying civil liberties and killing socialists and communists who resisted his authoritarian rule. Civil war flares up suddenly in Austria. The government, deciding to suppress the socialists, countered a general strike by martial law. These pictures, rushed to Britain from Vienna, show vividly the state of desperate crisis through which Austria has been passing. Strongholds in which the Schutzbund, or Socialist Defense League, hold out are huge blocks of flats built for the Viennese workers by the Socialist Council of the city. Here, the Socialists and Communists, suspicious of the dictatorship of Dr. Dolphus, have secreted guns and ammunition for the coup d'etat which they feared. The strength of the buildings enables them to prolong resistance for several days, and artillery has to be brought into action against them. Dr. Dolphus, the diminutive Chancellor of Austria, who as dictator has decreed the suppression of the Socialists, visits the scene of hostilities at Floridsdorf. Chile is by all odds the, the best success story in Latin America today. In fact, I did meet with Mr. Pinochet, but I was never advised by him. I never got a penny from the Chilean government, but I am more than willing to share in the credit for the extraordinary task, the job that our students did down there. Friedman and Harberger argued that free market economics went hand in hand with freedom and democracy. But in Chile, where their ideas were being implemented within the context of a military dictatorship, the opposite was true. Many in Latin America saw a direct connection between the economic shocks that impoverished millions of people and the epidemic of torture inflicted on those who believed in a different kind of society.
Hayek met with Pinochet and other regime officials in 1977, who Hayek described as educated, reasonable, and insightful men. Pinochet asked Hayek to send him copies of his writings, which Hayek did. While visiting Chile, Hayek gave an interview to El Mercurio, where he states that every now and then, democracy needs a good cleansing by a strong government. In his 1979 book, The Political Order of a Free People, Hayek writes, The normal working of such a society may yet have to be temporarily suspended, when the long-run preservation of that order is itself threatened. The Pinochet regime named its 1981 constitution after Hayek's book, The Constitution of Liberty. One of the first men to describe themselves as a libertarian in the United States was journalist H.L. Mencken, a white supremacist and anti-Semite who was part of the original America First movement, opposing the United States entering World War II. Mencken believed Darwin's theories of survival of the fittest should apply to society, and that the superior man should rule over what he saw as the inferior masses. This made him hostile towards all forms of democracy. Ayn Rand addressed Mencken in correspondence as the greatest representative of a philosophy to which she wanted to dedicate her life, individualism, and later described him as her favorite columnist. The newest proposals of having special millions spent on subnormal children is the attempt to bring everybody to the level of the handicapped. In 1928, Ayn Rand quoted the statement, What is good for me is right. This is a quote Rand grabbed from a newspaper article about child killer and psychopath William Edward Hickman. He is the best and strongest expression of a real man's psychology I have heard, Rand wrote. Rand was planning a novel called The Little Street to feature a Hickman-like character who she considered her ideal man. In her journals, Rand writes that Hickman is born with a wonderful, free, light consciousness, the absolute lack of social instinct or herd feeling. He does not understand because he has no organ for understanding, the necessity, meaning, or importance of other people. Other people do not exist for him, and he does not understand why they should. Rand also brazenly defended the Native American genocide perpetrated by colonialists. The Native Americans didn't have any rights to the land, and there is no reason for anyone to grant them rights which they had not conceived and were not using. What was it they were fighting for if they opposed white men on this continent? For their wish to continue a primitive existence? Their right to keep a part of the earth untouched, unused, and not even as property? Just keep everybody out so that you will live practically like an animal, or maybe a few caves above it? Any white person who brought the element of civilization had the right to take over this continent. They had no right to a country merely because they were born here and then acted like savages. The white man did not conquer this country. And you're a racist if you object because it means you believe that certain men are entitled to something because of their race. You believe that if someone is born in a magnificent country and doesn't know what to do with it, he still has a property right to it? He doesn't. Since the Indians did not have the concept of property rights, they didn't have a settled society. They had predominantly nomadic tribal cultures. They didn't have a right to the land and there was no reason for anyone to grant them rights that they had not conceived of and were not using. That is what, uh, in fact, makes man a sacrificial animal. That man must work for others, concern himself with others, or be responsible for them. In a series of controversial newsletters that Ron Paul admitted to writing in 1996, Ron Paul wrote, Duke lost the election, but he scared the blazes out of the establishment, and if the official Republican hadn't been ordered to drop out, he might have won. Duke's platform called for tax cuts, no quotas, no affirmative action, no welfare, and no busing. To many voters, this just seems like plain good sense. Duke carried baggage from his past, but the voters were able to overlook that. And if he had been awarded the forgiveness that an ex-communist gets, he might have won. Liberals like Richard Cohen of the Washington Post say he got so many votes because Louisianians were racist and ignorant. Baloney. Ron Paul also gives advice on how to get away with murdering black youth, writing, An ex-cop that I know advises that if you have to use a gun on a youth, you should leave the scene immediately, disposing of the wiped-off gun as soon as possible. Ron Paul's former chief of staff, Lou Rockwell, 
who was also a founder and chairman of the Mises Institute, was the editor of the newsletters. The racist and homophobic content didn't come as a surprise to those who closely followed the careers of Lou Rockwell and Ron Paul. Though Ron Paul now denies writing the newsletters, he admitted to writing them in 1996, insisting that there was nothing racist about the newsletters he had published for almost a decade. In February 2012, the hacker group Anonymous hacked into the emails of a white supremacist political party called American Third Position and discovered direct ties to Ron Paul. Lou Rockwell has published to his website several articles defending, even romanticizing, the brutal fascist dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet, which was orchestrated by the CIA. The generals denounced again and again for the death or disappearance of over 3,000 Chilean citizens and the alleged torture of thousands more. Their deaths and suffering should certainly not be mourned, any more than the deaths of Lenin, Stalin, and Hitler and their helpers should be mourned. Funny that the author invokes Hitler, considering this is the exact logic used by Hitler for the oppression of civil liberties and the mass murder of Jews and other groups that didn't bow down to the right-wing status tyranny. Let's also note that these same libertarians who claim to oppose big government and the state are on the side of the CIA, toppling any democratically elected leader who hasn't sold out to global capitalist interests. In 1970, Salvador Allende's popular unity government won the election on a platform of nationalization of large sectors of the economy. Chile's phone company was majority owned by the US corporation ITT. It spearheaded attempts to stop Allende becoming president. It had the support of Richard Nixon in the White House. I was not there, but I can uh, tell you what we now know to be a fact. He uh, ordered the CIA to, to prevent Allende from assuming the presidency. And indeed, they tried to get me to lean on the Chilean military right after Allende was elected. The libertarian author also blames the victims tortured and murdered by the Pinochet government. Contrary to the attitude of so many of today's intellectuals, Communists do not have a right to murder tens of millions of people and then complain when their intended victims prevent their takeover and in the process kill some of them. General Pinochet was thus one of the most extraordinary dictators in history. Allende murdered no one, and counter to Henry Kissinger's CIA propaganda, there isn't a shred of evidence he was planning to do so. Rockwell posted to his website, can we at least get another Pinochet? The right's imaginary opposition to big government is really getting comical. I think that they're recognizing that the alternative media is where the real action is and where the real mind shaping is going on. Now let's talk a little bit about the, what's called the Chilean miracle. And I find that term, oh, it's so annoying. It's sort of like, there's a guy, he's 300 pounds, he's eating less and exercising and he's losing weight. It's a miracle. No, it's not a miracle. It's the natural consequences of acting in a sensible sensible manner. manner. The Chicago boys, as you point out, Milton Friedman came down, met with him for 45 minutes, uh, did a bunch of speeches, wrote him a long letter about how to liberalize the economy, put an end to your price fixing, privatize stuff, and uh, and so on. And very quickly, the economy turned around. Poverty went from 50% down to 7%. You got per capita income going up 400% relatively quickly. And people say this is just some incomprehensible miracle. No, it's just these property rights, free trade, freedom of association, a smaller government. And now, of course, as you point out, Chile is the wealthiest country in Latin America. So it's not just Pinochet. They demonize the free market through the proxy of Pinochet. But their real target is if you claim to care about the poor, then you should be the most into free markets because free markets, they help the rich as well, but they help the poor in particular. He used a phrase that had never before been used in a real-world economic crisis. He called for shock treatment. He said that he was like a doctor that was going to help a country that was suffering an epidemic, and he was simply prescribing the medicine. Friedman wrote that General Pinochet was sympathetically attracted to the idea of a shock treatment but was clearly distressed at the temporary unemployment it might cause.
It rapidly became clear that Friedman's economic policies benefited the wealthy at the expense of the poor. It was calculated that a family trying to live on the average wage had to spend 74% of its income on bread. Items such as boss fares or milk became luxuries, and Pinochet got rid of free milk in school, a move that echoed the controversial policy of the young education minister in Britain, who would later become his friend. In order to enforce these economic policies, there had to be an enemy to fear. Tampoco lo digo que se haya triunfado totalmente sobre el marxismo. El marxismo es como un fantasma. Cuesta mucho tomarlo. Mejor dicho, no se puede tomar. Just as a reminder, when a right winger says Marxism, what they mean is the broad and differing ideology of socialism, and much of the time even include capitalists in their definition of Marxist. And yes, workers wanting self-determination and autonomy in the workplace is a hard idea to kill because it's a natural inclination that was even espoused by America's most pivotal president, Abraham Lincoln. And of course, right-wingers won't start branding all socialist Lincolnists instead of Marxist because he is a universally beloved figure, left, right, and center. This is the party of Lincoln. We believe all people are created equal in the eyes of God and our government. And they have a tough time demonizing the actual numbers, the actual reality on the ground of how free market reforms helped the poor in Chile. I think that they're recognizing that the alternative media is where the real action is and where the real mind shaping is going on. Monarchies are relatively superior over uh, democracy, traditional monarchies.